In this video, we're jumping back into some work on the ST. Those of you that have been watching for a while remember that there used to be another car here, my Mark 7 Ford Fiesta 1 litre EcoBoost. I'm currently rebuilding the engine in that car and I'm getting really close to finishing that. So I've had the car moved down to my parents where I'm doing the work on the engine. I was hoping to get another video on that out for you as soon as possible, but it just didn't happen like that. A few things didn't arrive and there's a couple of other little jobs that I need to get done before I can finish that off. So I did say in the last video that this video was gonna be the next step of that, but I, it just hasn't happened like that. And I apologize about that, but while I'm waiting to finish those last few little bits off and get the video sorted, I thought we could dive back into the Mark VI and finish off a job that I've been meaning to do for a long time. And that's to finish off the LED conversion. If you've seen the other videos I've done on that, we replaced all the LEDs in the heater panel and did the focus heater panel upgrade. We replaced all the bulbs in all these switches. We did the window switches. I've even changed all the bulbs in the standard radio to a white and red theme. And the one thing that's still letting it down is the clocks because I've still got the horrible old green bulbs in here and I'm starting to notice it more and more now as the nights start drawing in so I'm using the lights a lot more and therefore the interior lights are on a lot more so I'm really starting to notice the contrast between them and I thought this is a perfect opportunity to carry on and get these changed so I can finish the LED conversion. I've also had a set of custom dial cards made and they're going to look awesome but I'll show you those in a little bit for now I need to get the clocks out and we can change over the LEDs. In order to remove the clocks I first need to remove the cowling from around the steering column Turning the steering wheel 90 degrees to either side will reveal the two clips that hold the top and bottom pieces of the cowling together. These can be unclipped using a flat blade screwdriver and then the bottom portion can be detached from the steering column by removing the three Phillips screws underneath. The top piece along with its rubber gaiter are held to the rest of the dash with a couple of push fit clips and a screw on either side. The screw on the left hand side was actually missing on mine so I just thought the right hand side was stuck to start with but when I realised that there was actually supposed to be some screws I finally made some progress. The screw on the right hand side is sitting behind the panel that the little storage tray sits in. So I opened up the tray and then undid the two screws that are sitting behind it. And this allowed me to pull that panel forward just enough to get at the screw holding the top piece of the cowl on. There'll be another screw in the same position on the other side, but like I say, mine didn't have this one. With the cowling completely removed, this gives you access to the two screws that sit at the bottom of the clocks. And then after you've removed these two, there's just one more thing holding the clocks in. And that's a metal tab at the top between the very top of the cluster and the shroud that sits over the top of that that's part of the dashboard. Now you're gonna want something really thin to get in there to release it. Normally something like a steel ruler will just be fine, or in my case, I used a pallet knife. With that clip release, you should be able to pull the clocks forward, and then there's just one electrical connector to disconnect. I did find it quite tricky though. It's on one of those lever mechanisms like you probably find on the back of a radio wiring harness. And here's that little metal clip you need to release to pull the clocks forward, just so you can see what it looks like. Right, that's the clocks removed. So let's get these inside and we can start dismantling them. Okay, so we've got the clocks inside and on the bench. So the first thing I've got to remove is this plastic bezel. So there's just a load of clips around the outside to pop that off. So once this black plastic bezel's off and the clear screen should come with it, then we can get to the needles, pop them off. And then I think once the needles are off, we can take the PCB off the back. Okay, so we got the bezel off the front. And before we go any further, I just want to tell you guys that the original dial cards, if you're reusing them, then they scratch really easily. They're really delicate. So you want to be really careful when you're handling these, when you're removing the needles and all that stuff, because like I say, they scratch really easily. I'm replacing them, so it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to try my best not to scratch these up because you never know, I might want them again at some point in the future, but that's just one thing to be mindful of. Also, you want to note where your needles are pointing, take a photo or make some marks on it like I'm going to do with a Sharpie. When these go back on, you're probably going to have to adjust them anyway, because when you remove them, you have to twist as you pull, you twist in the opposite direction to the way the needle actually moves. So for example, for these two, because the needle travels around this way, when you pull, you wanna twist this way as you pull those off. And then again, these, because they move up and outwards, you wanna twist them inwards when you pull off. So that is just a couple of things I wanted to let you guys know. And I'm gonna show you a way of trying to protect this because you're probably gonna scratch it with your fingernails when you're trying to pull the dials off. So I'll show you a little trick that my good friend Roger told me to removing these. So I'm marking where the needles are pointing at rest, just with a Sharpie, using the casing that's on the back of here. And then the two at the top, I'm actually using reference points on the bottom here because they point to these corners of the plastic housing. So that's how I'm gonna remember where those are. So now it's time to remove the needles. And I've made this little kind of cover out of paper. So I'm just gonna slide that underneath the needle. You want it to be quite a tight fit because you don't want any of the clock cards showing from underneath, but sliding that underneath. And then, so I've got to pull and twist 
to the side. And let's see if I damage the clock card. Nope, no damage to the clock card. So that actually worked really well. It was Roger that gave me that idea. So cheers, Rog. On to the next one. So one thing I did forget to say is you kind of want to twist this a little bit first just to kind of break the seal and then comes off quite a lot easier. Again, no damage to the clock card. So we'll store those over there. I'll make another smaller version of this to do the two smaller ones and then we'll get those off. So there we go. There's the next little cover. So I'm just going to slide that in. And remember, this one moves up and out this way. So I want to turn it to the inside, pressing down. There we go. That's that one. Again, clock card intact. One more to do. Flip that over. This one, I need to twist inwards again, so the opposite direction. And there we go. So that's all the needles off. Now we can remove the original clock card. There's a couple of little tabs just holding the clock card in place, like here, another one over here. There's a couple on the sides. So you just want to unpick the corner of the card from there, and then it should all just lift off. It's also one in each of the larger dials. Just on the bottom, there's a little tab on the plastic housing to try and remove. So it holds this card in place. There we go. So that's the original clock card removed. So I'm gonna go and store this in a safe place just so it doesn't get damaged. And then we can get the LEDs behind here. So the next job is just to pop the PCB out the back of this housing and there's just a few clips around the outside that you just carefully need to pry out the way and then you should be able to lift the PCB out. Doesn't sound too nice, but I don't think that's the clips breaking, it's just a little noise it's making it slides past the PCB. One thing you do need to be careful of, the LCD screen stays in place and there's just some very delicate pins along the bottom here for the LCD screen that slot into this connector here. So you do want to be really careful that you're not like twisting this and bending those pins and damaging them in any way, but I managed to get this off without too much hassle. So now that's off. We also expose the LEDs that are on the back of the screen because so I'm going to be changing the colour of those as well. The screen's going to be going red and then all the illumination for the dials is going to be white. Now the LEDs that we're going to be changing is 12 of these 1206 LEDs. There's five around the rev counter, there's five around the miles per hour and then there's one behind each of the temperature and fuel gauges. So those are all the 1206s and then for the LCD screen there is nine PLCC 3528s and that is this group of LEDs in the middle here. Now I've been over the soldering process and how to check the polarity of your LEDs in other videos I've done on LED conversion so I'm not going to go through that in this video. If you want to know more about that then go and check those videos out. There'll be links in the description below and I've also made a playlist for all of the LED conversion videos so you can find them all in one place. So I'm just going to rattle through and change all these LEDs out and then show you the finished result. Oh and there is one more LED I'm going to be changing out and that's this 1206 LED here. So this is to tell you that your side lights are on. I'm going to be changing that from green to white, but I wouldn't recommend changing any of the other warning lights on here, especially not the indicators or anything like that. Roger told me that he's done a set for a guy. Um, he changed the color of the indicator bulbs and it just caused all sorts of problems. It thought there was a blown bulb, like the actual indicator bulb was blown and it just wasn't working. So I wouldn't recommend messing with any of that stuff. But I, like I say, I am going to change out this side light one. And for those of you that are going to have a go at this job yourself, I've gone ahead and marked the negative side of each LED. So you can take a screenshot and then use this rather than having to check them all yourselves. Okay, so that's all the LEDs changed over and I have just quickly nipped out to the car to plug this in and check that I've done everything correct and that they're all working and they are. So it's time to start putting the clocks back together. 
Oh, and it's probably about time I showed you these. These are my new dial cards from SJ Conversion. And how good do they look? I'll leave a link to SJ Conversion's Facebook page down in the description so you can find them and get a custom set of dials for yourself if you're willing to take on this job. Or failing that, you can always contact my good friend Roger and he can do the conversion for you and install a new set of dial mats while he's at it. But come on, they look so good. So we've got the ST150 logo down here, we've got the Mountune logo down here, and you can go for pretty much, like I said, any design you want. A lot of people go for like carbon fiber, but I've gone for this kind of crushed carbon effect, which I think is gonna look really cool. So let's go ahead and get these clocks built back up with the new dial cards. Okay, so we're pretty much ready to put this back in the car, but before we go ahead and stick the bezel back on here, I'm just gonna pop this back in here briefly, plug it in, and I just wanna go for a little drive and check that all the needles are in the right position. And I'm gonna show you guys how you can do that using the LCD screen and the information that you can display on it using a special test mode. So I'm plugging the clocks back in and then just resting them in there loosely. To enter the test mode, you press and hold the trip computer button on the end of the indicator stalk. Keep that held in, put the key in, and then turn it to ignition, but don't start the car. Keep the button on the end of the indicator stalk pressed until the display reads test mode, then release it. Each subsequent press of the trip button just cycles through the menu in the same way the normal trip computer does. The first couple of screens are some cool tests like a gauge sweep and also an LED test. As you cycle through the menu, Menus further, you can display real time information such as road speed and engine speed, and these are the ones that we're here for. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into test mode, then I'm going to go to miles per hour, we're going to start the car, I'm going to go for a little drive, and then I'm just going to check that the reading I'm getting on the screen matches roughly what I'm getting with the needle. And if there is any adjustments that need to be made, then I can make those. This is why I've left the bezel off because if I need to adjust the needles at all, then I need the bezel to be off of here so that I can get to it and kind of shunt this back into where it needs to be. If the needle's too far ahead of where it needs to be, so say it's showing 50 miles an hour, but our little screen down here says 40 miles an hour, then all I'll need to do is nudge it back about that much when it's at the bottom here. So I'll have to make a, a rough estimate and then push the needle back. But if it's actually behind where it needs to be, you can't just wind it forwards because what that'll do is that'll actually spin the motor that the needle sits on. So if we're reading 40, but the screen down here says 50 and we need to advance it, then basically I've got to go all the way back around to about the distance I need to advance it to here, if that makes sense. So all the way back around. So say that was about the same distance between the needle and the 10 miles an hour, I'd go all the way back around to 10 rather than back to here. And then when we get back up to speed again, hopefully that should be around about the same place. I hope that makes sense anyway. And it'll be the same case with all of these dials. So again, if this one is the same way around, you know, if, I, if we need to go backwards, then that's fine. We can do that. If we need to go forwards, then we'd have to go all the way back around in reverse. And then with these ones, because they travel in different directions, again, it will be the reverse to the way that these travel, like the way we had to turn them when we remove the needles. Okay, so I've got the car running, we're in test mode, and I've got this set to engine speed. So this is the best way I can show you because obviously I can't really show you the miles per hour because I don't even want to drive around trying to film. But if I can show you the rev counter over here and you can see the engine speed on there, we're showing around about 800 RPM is what it says it's idling at. And looking at the gauge, I'd say we're probably not far off that, but let's see, I'm not entirely sure of the divisions between that. So let's see if we can raise it to, to something easy to read. So I'm gonna raise the revs up to about 2000, try and hold it there. And you know what? Oh, it's difficult to hold it in one place, but you know what? I think we're pretty much spot on with that. So you know what? I actually don't think I'm gonna to have to adjust that one. And I have actually already been up the road and had a quick look at the miles per hour one and that is within one mile an hour. I just went up the lane. I mean, I will test it at higher speeds out on the open road, but went up my lane, did about 20 miles an hour, and it was showing like 19 on here when I was at 20 on the gauge. So I think I've got those ones pretty much dialed in. I'm not sure about the temperature and the fuel gauge. Now the fuel gauge, I think the only way I can really check that is to fill it up all the way and then make adjustments there. And then with the engine temperature, I have been running the car for a little while. I've just got home from work for today and that should be, it should be a touch higher, I think. So I think I am gonna have to adjust 
the temperature gauge because it normally does sit bang on in the middle here. <clears throat> Either that or we need to do another thermostat. So I'm just gonna cycle through here till we get to engine temp, there we go. So we're currently showing 94 degrees. So, or 95 now. So it is rising slightly because I'm just sat here. But this point right here should be bang on 90. So we are reading a little bit low. So I'm gonna adjust this one just to show you what I mean on how to adjust these. So first of all, I need to turn the engine off. So you can see how the needle is sitting well, just before the 60 there, and it was sitting just before the 90 mark here. So I can't just push it forward this way, because like I said, that's just gonna spin the motor. So what you wanna do is rather than trying to advance it, you actually wanna wind it back. And what that's doing is it's not actually spinning the, the little motor that moves this in reverse, but it's actually just moving the dial or the needle around the little post that it sits on. So we want it to be I'd say about that. It normally sits just before it. That's probably a bit too far. Let's go around again. I reckon there is probably about where we want to be. So I'm going to put it in test mode and then start the car again and see what that's showing. Actually, I wonder if it'll show us. I wonder if it'll show us the engine temperature without the car running. I'm going to try that. So I'm just cycling through again, and then eventually we should get to. Engine temp, we're still reading 95, hasn't cooled down yet. And as you can see, we're just a touch over the 90 mark there. So I think I've got that pretty much bang on now, but I just wanted to show you that on how to kind of reset that. So hopefully that all makes sense. I'll check the fuel another time. Like I'm not gonna check that now because I'm not going to fill up right now. But other than that, I think that's pretty much all the gauges set to exactly where I need them to be. And now that's all set. It's time to put the instrument cluster back together so we can see the finished result. Right, that's everything back together. Let's show you how these dials are looking. They look awesome, and if you think they look good, you should see them at night time. So there we go, that's the clocks completed and that's the full interior LED conversion also completed. I can't believe I waited so long to finish that off, but now I've done it, I'm so glad that I have done it because they look awesome. I can't believe how well that's turned out. And you know what? I actually think it makes the instrument cluster look a little bit more modern as well. At nighttime when it's all lit up, it almost looks almost looks like it's a, a digital dash from like a, a modern Audi or Mercedes or something like that. I know obviously it's not, but that's kind of what it looks like to me anyway, or at least at nighttime, but it doesn't matter what I think. What I want to know is what you guys think. So please leave a comment below of what you think of not only the LED conversion, but also that custom dial card from SJ Conversions. Like I said earlier in the video, there'll be a link to their Facebook page so you can pick up something like that for yourself. You can get them for all sorts of different cars. It's not just Fords and not just Fiestas. You can get them for Vauxhall Corsas, Astras, and God knows how many more that he does. So drop him a message if you can't see something on there for your car, because I'm sure he'll be able to sort you out. And likewise, if you're looking to get the LED swap done for you for the clocks or any of the other interior LEDs, then check out Roger Andrew. Again, a link to his Facebook will be in the description. I'm hoping that in the next video, we'll be diving back into the Mark 7 content. But if you did enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up because it really helps me out. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you hit that subscribe button, then I'll see you in the next video.